Okay, uh, well first let me uh, say thank you uh, very much to Siam for this uh, nice honor. Uh, my friends have reminded me that the only way you're even eligible for a career award is to be really, really old. So uh, thanks, Siam, for also reinforcing that fact uh, in my mind. Uh, the idea for the title for my talk came from a talk that uh, uh, Bill Gropp gave a few years ago when he received this same award. And his title was A Tale of Two Timelines, which I took to be an allusion to Charles Dickens. And so I've picked another uh, title that's uh, kind of a nod to Dickens and my own favorite story of his Christmas Carol. Uh, but before I talk about ghosts, uh, I'd like to show this slide and thank the many collaborators I've been fortunate uh, to work with over the years, uh, developing a variety of open source software together with them. And these folks come from a variety of uh, disciplines, uh, both physical science, engineering science, a lot of materials experts on that list, people from computer science and mathematics as well. <clears throat> and intentionally on this slide, I only listed people that are at Sandia where I work, uh, or at least were at Sandia at the time, and I did that uh, to emphasize this last point on the slide. And this applies not just to Sandia, but to all the large DOE labs, and I'm sure to other large government-funded labs, both in the US and elsewhere. And that is that these kind of laboratories are a great place to do interdisciplinary kinds of software development and science work, and that's because they bring together people from all these disciplines and co-locate them in the same place so they can work together. So if you're interested in working on huge, challenging science problems, uh, not just that the US is interested in, but the whole world, check out the DOE labs. They're a great place uh, to do that kind of work. All right, so let's talk about the first ghost of parallel computing past. Uh, this one was pretty easy for me to pick. I chose Gordon Moore as the uh, ghost of computing past, or parallel computing past. And his picture reminds me, in this talk at least, you don't have to be dead to be a ghost. Uh, he's still doing well, I think. Uh, his law is so well known that it has its own law listed here. The number of people predicting the death of Moore's law doubles every two years. <laughs> so I think in this audience in 2020, we're pretty far along that exponential growth curve as well. Uh, <clears throat> the reason I picked this is uh, at the chip level, his law is obviously uh, uh, predicted the growth, the tremendous growth of the speed of individual chips and then was the cost reduced that's enabled people who architect large parallel machines to make them larger and larger. So in both those dimensions, we've been able to go from a gigaflop, the first gigaflop machine in a Linpack sense in the late 80s, to in the next couple years, a few exaflop machines, both in the US and elsewhere. So that's a billion times speed up over 30 years. So if you plug that into the little exponential growth curve, that means we've been doubling Linpack flops every 14 months for 33 years, which is astounding, I think. So what about the ghost of parallel computing present? Well, this one uh, had to think about a little more, but I picked GPUs. So this is a picture of the Terminator with an NVIDIA GPU implanted in its brain. And I picked that because GPUs are slowly terminating the competition, at least at the high end of HPC. So it's been about 10 years since NVIDIA introduced the first general purpose GPU and CUDA at the same time. That sparked a huge interest in the scientific computing community. That was followed up by double precision, error correcting memory, multi-GPU nodes, NV-Link to communicate fast between GPUs on a node, all things the scientific community has grabbed onto and benefited from. So at a higher level, you probably know all the largest HPC platforms are increasingly becoming GPU based. That's true for all four of the next big DOE machines, uh, at NERSC, Argonne, Oak Ridge, and uh, Livermore. Now Intel will actually say the word GPU in public. In fact, uh, the next big machine they're building at uh, Argonne is going to be GPU based with their own new GPUs. And within this community, I think there's been over the last 10 years countless talks in this conference and our sister CS&E uh, conference on the topic of GPUs. So just a quick show of hands, how many here have worked on GPUs, code, algorithms, development? Pretty good fraction. Okay, so what have these two ghosts meant uh, for scientific computing writ large over these last 30 years? Well, the good news, I think, is it's been effectively free speed up. 
Uh, it's more science, even if we don't change our algorithms or codes that much, that we can do uh, with the codes. We haven't had, even though there's been a lot of algorithmic work, we haven't even had to rely on it sometimes for uh, new algorithms because our old algorithms will work well on these machines and we can do new kinds of science in modeling and simulation. So just a couple numbers uh, to illustrate this point. The Cray YMP processor, the first gigaflop machine, one of those processors out of eight would run LinPack at 270 megaflops. If you've used 25 years later a Blue Gene Q machine, not a node in that machine, it was actually a pretty slow CPU even at the time, but a single core of that Blue Gene Q uh, node would run it at 11 gigaflops, which is 40 times faster. A more modern CPU, it's nearly 100 times faster on a single core of an Intel Broadwell or its KNL chip uh, to perform this LinPack calculation. GPUs have obviously gone even further. Well, if there's good news, there has to be bad news, and it's that the previous good news was partially fake news. That speed up really wasn't free. It was a ton of work, a lot of it by this community, to adapt our algorithms and codes to first be MPI parallel and then be GPU parallel. And in fact, scientific applications, the vast majority did not see that billion X speed up. They see as the machines get more and more complex, less and less of that LINPACK speed up in practical scientific applications. So effectively, we've been building machines as we pursue this high flop number that have become harder to use and program. And that, I think, has had two uh, sort of bad effects on the science. Uh, one is sort of a Darwinian selection principle. We've been down selecting for applications that can actually run well on these less general purpose machines. And I'll show a table on the next slide to illustrate that. And then there's an opportunity cost. All the effort we've had to do, uh, you know, adapting our algorithms and codes to run on this, these uh, evolving kinds of hardware has meant less time to develop really new algorithms and focus on science issues that might have helped. So here's the table. Uh, I'm going to show you a list of all those machines going from gigaflop to exaflop. And for each one, cite two numbers, what I call balance ratios. So local balance is the number of flops you have to do uh, if you want to run at LINPACK speed to pay for the cost of fetching one word out of local memory on the node or on the GPU on that machine. Remote balance is the same thing, the number of flops to fetch one word from another node through a large message. So here's the table. Uh, the machine's going, let's see if I can use my winner here shows up, yep, going over the past 30 years. These are the LINPACK numbers. The Cray machine initially 30 years ago was a very well-balanced machine. You could actually pull two words from memory, either locally or remotely across the eight nodes, and just have to do one flop to run at LINPACK speeds. That quickly changed to tens and even hundreds, and look at the current machines. We're in the ballpark of 100 flops you have to do locally to pay the cost of grabbing one word. And Summit is actually the big machine at Oak Ridge, GPU-based, is 10,000 flops you have to do to pay the, pay the cost to get one word uh, from another processor or another node. So the exascale machines that are coming, these are the two that DOE is going to stand up. Uh, still being designed, they'll certainly be an exaflop, but the, the balance numbers here are not known, but I think you can see the trend. We're certainly going to be in the ballpark of hundreds or thousands remotely of words that we have to, or of flops that we have to do to support memory access. Okay, so at this point, you're probably thinking, this is a SIAM conference. Why are we talking about hardware ghosts? Shouldn't algorithms or the people who develop them be some of our ghosts? So my criteria, this could be a personal bias because I'm a, a modeling simulation person, uh, uh, person. The way I picked ghost is what has enabled over this 30 year time frame the most science to be done with the work and the tools that we develop as a computational science community. So, uh, to my mind, I couldn't think of a single algorithm or even a, a, a one algorithm or a even a class of algorithms that have had as much impact on the science that's being done on these computers by any science field that does computation as much as the availability of these billion times faster supercomputers. And that's obviously trickled down to the desktop that we have machines that are dramatically faster than what was available 30 years ago as, as well. So. Um, here's the way I thought about it. These dramatically faster machines have enabled new science in every single discipline that does computation. They've motivated all of our work on parallel algorithms to find and exploit both distributed and now thread level kinds of parallelism in our codes. Uh, there's certainly been a lot of great algorithmic work on developing more accurate uh, models and methods, uh, but those often need faster machines to actually be effective. 
Imagine if you could take your current state-of-the-art algorithms that you've worked on for a long time, and if you had to run it on a 30-year-old platform where the entire platform was less than the speed of one core on a desktop today, how much science would you be able to do with those algorithms? So I mentioned this at kind of the midpoint of my talk because I think the future is very unlikely to be like the past. I don't think we're going to see another billion X speed up in the, the class of the top machine at the top, uh, top of the top 500 list. And that means there's going to be increasing opportunity and even pressure on algorithms to provide new science. It may mean that we're using different kinds of machines that are not as flop centric. It may be that we have to use the machines that we have and still get more science out of them with better algorithms. So let's first talk about the new future. Uh, my hardware colleagues tell me that specialization of SOCs, systems on a chip, are going to be a coming dominant theme. And this is being enabled by the ARM ecosystem that's creating a variety of design tools that make this custom design of silicon much easier. Uh, what a system on a chip is, is a, essentially silicon CPU that has multiple IP uh, intellectual property blocks embedded in the silicon. So each IP block you can think of in a scientific computing sense as encoding one kernel that you might want to run essentially at ASIC speed because it's right there on the silicon. So in a traditional sense that could be matrix matrix multiply, the kind of ideas we've heard about in these two talks previously this morning. Could be matrix vector operations, tensor operations like our last speaker talked about. Could be FFTs, maybe you want to encode your MPI protocols in one of these I blocks so they run uh, very fast. If we could figure out to do it, they might be more exotic blocks, things that do neuromorphic computing or quantum computing, but there's a materials issue there with fabricating that in place on the silicon. As an example, the latest iPhone chip has about 40 of these IP blocks, and they do things we expect phones to do fast and at low power, like process speech or video or images or track your motion by uh, communicating with GPS. So once you have those chips, the specialization of high performance computers could be to aggregate those chips and customize them for individual scientific disciplines. So imagine the fusion science office within DOE wants to build an HPC platform that's good for modeling the ITER reactor. It needs to be able to do MHD, which is a finite element method, and PIC, a particle method. Or we might imagine machines customized for MD. That's actually already happened with the DE Shaw company's work on Anton but we might make ones for PIC or for CFD. If we're clever, maybe we can make machines that are good for a class of simulations, like particle methods, or like finite element methods that need sparse iterative solvers. So if you think about it, to my mind, this is continuing this trend that we progressed over the last 30 years of making machines more specialized, giving up generality to gain speed for specific applications. So, the question is where are the experts going to come that can actually make these programs work to do, or these machines work to do science? They have to understand the science application, they have to have a great knowledge of the methods and the algorithms that are used, and they have to be able to program at a very low level to get great performance off these machines. Well, I think the good news is those people are in this room. This is kind of job security for SIAM members over the next few years to be able to work on these kind of platforms. So now, let's look more at a career size window of time. Uh, like I looked 30 years back for my career. Now, 30 years ahead, are we going to get another billion X speed up, which would mean we progress uh, through this sequence of uh, prefixes on the scientific uh, scale up to 10 to the 27th, which is so out there that NIST hasn't even decided fully on a prefix for that yet. Well, I can see a couple problems with this. The first is kind of whimsical. Maybe it's a PR problem. But to my mind, these sound more like Dr. Seuss prefixes than they do scientific words. So this is supposed to indicate the mixed emotions scientific apps have at looking at the progression of supercomputers. This knot was required by our legal people to make people assure them that this wasn't actually a Dr. Seuss book. So I'm imagining that when DOE goes to Congress, for example, and asks for funding for one of these machines, the following kind of Abbott and Costello routine might take place. DOE says, we'd like funding Congress for a new Yada flop machine. Congress says, I know it's a lot of flops, but how many exactly? Uh, DOE says, I told you, it's a Yada flops. Cong whoops, sorry. Congress says, oh, OK, let me guess. Will it also cost a Yada dollars? DOE, no, not a Yada dollars, but yes, a whole lot of dollars. <laughs> so that's a good segue to my next slide. This is a plot of the prices of these high-end computers over the last 30 years. 
So the eight processor Cray YMP, two gigaflops in the late 80s cost about $25 million. Uh, Aurora and Frontier DOE's imminent uh, exascale machines are going to cost $600 million each. So I should say these numbers are a bit fuzzy. The very few people who actually know these numbers don't want to tell you. And the second thing is these are kind of one-off. Oh, I should say, so the only way I was able to get them was by going to an unbiased source, which is a Google search. So I think these are pretty accurate, but they're just ballpark. Uh, the second point is a lot of these machines are one-offs. So what should be included in the price? The research and development to create them, the building you have to build uh, to put them in, the power you use to, to uh, power them, uh, not clear. But these are just sort of the listed price that they're exchanging with the companies to get the final machine. So the question is, if we're going to go to 10 exaflops or 50 exaflops, is anybody going to pay north of a billion dollars for one of these machines? And I think the answer is increasingly going to be probably not. Okay, so if we have to turn to different kinds of computing paradigms or maybe uh, different ways to use the machines that we have now that are very high flop, uh, counts in order to do new science, what are the candidates? So I'm going to give you three candidates for possible future ghosts that might be themes that impact science the most over the next decades. So the first is neuromorphic computing. If this really becomes a dominant uh, theme, then maybe Carver Mead, who I think coined the term neuromorphic, would be the one of the ghosts. Or if we're really successful, maybe data from Star Trek could be the future ghost. Uh, neuromorphic comes in a lot of forms. Uh, I'm going to show you one here with this schematic that I know something about because it's worked on at Sandia, and I think you'll see the connection to the kind of scientific computing we do a lot of these days. Uh, this is what's called a memorist or crossbar, and it's a set of wires on silicon that go in one direction and another set that go a perpendicular to it underneath it. And between every crossing, there's a little variable resistor, in this case called a memristor, that can take on different values. And so as shown here, if you pulse in, a vector of voltages across the rows. You get out a set of uh, currents here, a vector of currents across the columns, and you've effectively performed a matrix vector multiply, where the matrix values are the uh, values of each of those resistors. So you get a MATVEC essentially in one cycle. Uh, if you're doing machine learning, you can use high voltages to nudge those individual resistances to different values, set the weights in your matrix, or you can lose lower voltages to just classify a new set of inputs. The promise here is this is very low power, very fast. You get n squared operations per clock, uh, and you can fabricate it at very small size on the silicon. The challenges are really mostly in the materials and making the way you fabricate it reproducible across an array of these resistors. There's limits to how big you can make the matrix, maybe at most 1,000 by 1,000, and I'm only showing dense operations here. Sparsity is a real challenge. How would you do that with this kind of hardware system? Maybe the biggest challenge for science, though, is it's very low precision. Those little resistances you can only control to maybe four bits of precision, eight bits if you're really lucky. Is that enough to do science calculations with? OK, the second candidate ghost, maybe it's quantum computing that's going to be a future ghost for us. So if that's the case, Richard Feynman, I think, was the first person to propose that quantum effects could be used for computing tasks. Peter Shore was a theorist who proposed an algorithm that's motivated quantum computing for the last 25 years, even though no one's been able to run it yet on a quantum computer. It's to do integer factorization in a time that's polynomial in the log of the size of the integer. So that's nearly exponentially faster than you could do with any classical algorithm or on a traditional supercomputer. So the promise then is maybe quantum computing would be truly awesome in a, in a much lower complexity sense uh, in at least a couple of domains. It could be cryptography because of the integer factorization, or maybe it's simulating quantum minibody effects without having to solve Schrodinger's equation. You would do it directly with the quantum effects within the computer. So the challenges are, again, all about materials. Can you really scale this up to a large machine? How do you even program it or get your physical representation of the problem into the computer or the answer out in a way that you can understand it and do some science? Sorry. Just, just a couple things here. OK, so as an aside, I wanted to mention maybe this kerfuffle that you might have read about uh, in recent months about quantum supremacy. So this is a term defined by the quantum computing folks to define the moment at which some quantum computer can perform a calculation that's totally intractable on a traditional supercomputer. And a few months ago, 
Google claimed they had achieved quantum supremacy in a Nature paper. Their 53 qubit machine had computed some quantity in 200 seconds, and they estimated it would take 10,000 years on the Summit supercomputer, DOE's uh, largest computer. Well, it didn't take 10,000 years for IBM to respond. They were the uh, architects of Summit, and they said it only took about a week or two, actually. They said it would really only take 2.5 days to do this on Summit. It would be, and that's the worst case, and it would be more accurate than what you just did on your quantum computer. So Google, no supremacy for you. So what was X? In this case, it was generating what they call certifiable random numbers, which means that you can provably show that the next random number in the sequence cannot be figured out from random numbers that came before. So I thought this discussion back and forth, the debate was kind of humorous, maybe even certifiable. Uh, but I, then I thought for a moment and I said, where did the quantum computing group or uh, community get the idea that you should pick one narrow benchmark that only applies to a small, tiny fraction <laughs> of scientific applications and make that the definition of supremacy? The next thing you know, somebody's going to want to make a ranked list of where all the quantum computers fall on computing that benchmark, and then somebody will want to post it on the internet so people can look at it and brag about their machine or compete with other machines. So I don't know about you, that seems odd that they would choose to go down that path. I don't know where they got the idea. Okay, so Jack, if you're out there, I'm sorry. This was, uh, couldn't resist, I guess, to uh, mention this. Okay. So the third candidate ghost would be something a lot of you are working on, machine learning and AI. We've heard about it in this conference a lot yesterday with one of the uh, panel discussions. So if this becomes the dominant theme in scientific computing, maybe John Hopfield, the originator of neural networks, is a ghost, or more recently Hinton and Lacoon, who won a Turing Award a couple of years ago for their work on deep neural networks that has obviously triggered a huge explosion of interest both in commercial companies and now in scientific computing. So I've heard various opinions from people in this community about this. Some people say it's already the next revolution. Last year, DOE created an AI technology office for what that's worth. And this is a quote from Dave Womble that uh, he adopted from Microsoft, who was actually talking about the effect of technology on school teachers. And I think it's a bit, he meant it a bit tongue in cheek, but I think it's interesting. AI won't replace scientists and engineers, but scientists and engineers who use AI will replace people who don't. So this is maybe a good time to make a mental uh, note and check your CV tonight, see how many times uh, ML and AI appear on that CV. I've also heard other people say machine learning is already overhyped. It's just glorified fitting. Uh, it's repackaged linear algebra and numerical optimization methods that this community already knows well and in fact invented some of those methods. So I don't know where the truth is. Maybe it's somewhere in between. We'll have to see. But let me give you one example from my field of where there's a lot of excitement about uh, machine learning. So in classical molecular dynamics, we use simple empirical uh, equations that are derived from physics usually to model the forces between atoms so that we can time integrate them and simulate a system. Those are almost always uh, very cheap and linear in, uh, in cost in the number of atoms so we can scale up the system large both in time and in size. But the ultimate accuracy would, we would like to achieve is what uh, quantum calculations give you, which are methods that are typically order n cubed or worse in scaling. So the holy grail would be to have these cheap interatomic classical potentials that get this quantum accuracy. So there's been a lot of work on using neural net potentials uh, to try to achieve this. So the idea is uh, that you have a big system and for each atom in it, you just look at its local neighborhood, maybe a few dozen or a hundred atoms, and you have some geometric descriptors, some basis set that describes those. You input the set of coefficients as a vector into your neural net. And it's been trained against the results of a whole ton of small quantum calculations on small systems uh, to produce forces and energies for those systems. And the neural net, once it gets trained, allows you to put in this geometry as a vector of inputs and get out the forces on that one atom, uh, the components of it that are quantum accurate. So there's lots of issues with this. How do you choose the optimal and hopefully small set of configurations to train on because they're very expensive to do the quantum calculation for? How do you detect or quantify errors so you know if you're in a configuration in your MD system that you need new quantum data uh, to train against? 
And transferability in the material sense means that each time you want to do a simulation at a different temperature or a different pressure, or maybe you alloy some material with a few different kinds of elements, small quantities of those, do you need a totally new potential or can you reuse some information about the potential you have? If you can't do that, then maybe this becomes a new potential for every simulation and we have to run a lot of quantum for each one so it's not that big a savings. So, Lots of excitement. This has already been a hot topic in material science for several years, but I think the jury is still out on how useful it is. And I think that's also emblematic of machine learning at a larger scale across science as we're still trying to figure out what can it really do for modeling and simulation and scientific computing generally. So, I'm almost finished. I've given you uh, several ideas here for candidate future ghosts of parallel computing, but I think the real answer uh, to paraphrase uh, Charles Dickens in A Christmas Carol is the future has not yet been written. So maybe it's one of your pictures uh, one, from one of you uh, here in the audience that needs to be that future ghost or could become that future ghost of parallel computing. Uh, so again, my metric for that is going to be what has the greatest impact on the science that could be done with the tools uh, this community produces. And if machine learning is a candidate, then it, this I think is the key question we have to answer. Is machine learning just a distraction from the really hard algorithmic and hard science questions that our science colleagues demand answers to? Or is machine learning a silver bullet that's actually going to answer some of those challenges? So with that, here's a brief summary of my talk. I've tried to convince you the last 30 years has been relatively easy for the scientific commuting, uh, community because of the machines getting so dramatically faster. But the next 30 will be different, harder, and therefore more interesting. And there'll be many more opportunities uh, for algorithms to provide impact uh, that takes us to better science. So with that, I will thank uh, the Exascale Computing Project for funding, and a few colleagues at Sandia, both for producing the Photoshop slides and uh, educating me some on the hardware. And I will simply close with this disclaimer. Thank you. Nobody wants to defend LINPAC? Okay. So Steve, thank you for a very engaging talk. So you seem to indicate that in the last 30 years, the billion fold increase in the capability, hardware capabilities of the machines surpassed whatever algorithms could bring to bear. Uh, do you have a prediction for uh, exaflop and beyond, do you feel that algorithms would be playing a greater role in the future or uh, how, how does that, how does that uh, work with respect to other hardware uh, in advances you're talking about like system on a chip and so on? Yeah. Well, first let me say, I wasn't saying algorithms didn't play a huge role for the past 30 years. I just said I picked the thing that I thought was the biggest uh, impact and that was the faster computers and I tried to list how that sort of enabled lots of algorithmic work that I think has been really great. But going forward, I do definitely think that algorithms are going to have to be more important. If, if we're going to actually use quantum computers or neuromorphic computers to do actual science, uh, there's, there are going to be totally different kind of algorithms that have to be developed. If machine learning is really going to be the trick that makes us be able to use the big resources that we have, then obviously there's already ongoing algorithmic, algorithmic work in that area. But I think we still have to, to show that it can really have scientific impact on the physical sciences and our customers who are those scientists. So did that answer your question okay? All right? <laughs>